Now, from the transatlantic sphere, we will shift our attention back to Europe's role in the multilateral order, and especially Europe's role in its own neighborhood. After the French veto on the accession talks um, uh, towards Albania and North Macedonia, we have a new debate about the EU and the role of the EU as a transformative power in its neighborhood. We initially had the pleasure to welcome His Excellency Edi Rama, but as you have, uh, might have heard in the news, the uh, terrible earthquake happened in Albania, um, which is uh, quite, quite a shocking news from today morning, so the Prime Minister unfortunately of course, had his cancel, to cancel his visit to Berlin, and we obviously send our best wishes to the Prime Minister and to the people of Albania. We therefore will continue immediately to the panel discussion with our panelists that will follow afterwards. This panel discussion will be moderated by Natalie Tocci. She's the director of the Italian Institute, International Affairs Institute and special advisor to High Representative Mogherini, and we have a particular high-level panel to discuss the EU's role in the neighborhood. We have Foreign Minister of Georgia, David Salkaliani. We have the Deputy Foreign Minister of Ukraine, Aliona Zerkal. We have with us Valery Voronetsky, the Chairperson of the Standing Commission on International Affairs in the Belarusian House of Representatives. And we have with us Roderich Kiesewetter, Special Representative for Foreign Affairs of the CDU-CSU Parliamentary Group. Thank you so much for your time, and please join me on stage. Good, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, indeed, um, when talking about uh, the EU as a transformative power, I think really the place to start is to uh, point out that there was indeed a whole generation of academics, policymakers, think tankers such as myself that indeed uh, looked at uh, the European Union as a transformative, a normative power, largely exerting this power through uh, civilian uh, means, uh, but indeed having real effect, a uh, real effect not only to the transformation of countries that entered the European Union, but also uh, and primarily of the countries that were in the process of entering uh, the European Union. Now, of course, all this was happening at a particular historical juncture, which we now commonly refer to as the international liberal order. Uh, and so to make, in a sense, the link between what we we're going to be discussing over the next hour or so, uh, and what we have been uh, discussing this morning uh, about the challenges of multilateralism uh, and the rules-based order, uh, I think there's an important and interesting and in many respects disturbing connection between uh, these two sets of things. Uh, in the same way as it is clear that that multilateral rules-based international order uh, is beginning to fray. Uh, I think uh, it is not a coincidence that that fraying is also happening uh, when it comes to the transformative power of the European Union. Now, this is very clear uh, in the case and in the countries that are currently in the enlargement process, uh, meaning the countries of uh, the Western uh, Balkans, uh, well, theoretically, and Turkey as well, but... Um, we know where that is at this particular point in time. Uh, but it's a question, this issue of the uh, transformative power or lack thereof uh, of the European Union is, of course, uh, also, uh, and in some respects, even uh, more important when we talk about countries that are currently in the uh, Eastern Partnership uh, of, of the European Union. Now, in my mind, when we think about this question, there are really sort of four sets of issues which I think would be extremely interesting for this uh, distinguished panel to address. Now, two of them are old questions, uh, and two of them are newer uh, questions. The old questions, and by old questions I mean that these are questions that have been there since the very beginning of the debate uh, and the policy, uh, have to do with, if you like, the demand and supply side of, of, of transformative uh, power. 
so in terms of supply, uh, what is there on offer? You know, to what extent uh, is the uh, credibility, the value of what is on offer perceived uh, as such uh, by countries that are uh, in uh, the Eastern Partnership? Um, and of course, the big question is, what exactly is it that is on offer? Uh, and, and of course, it's a question that has not really been definitively addressed. But then on the other hand, there is uh, the, uh, the side of the Eastern partners, uh, countries themselves, uh, and, and therefore the reform process uh, if in the Eastern partnership countries. If the EU is to be a transformative power, then obviously there should be some transformation that we uh, ought to be talking about. And, and by transformation, I'm obviously talking about governance, I'm talking about uh, the economy, about uh, political participation, democracy, conflict resolution. I mean, we know what the uh, menu uh, is. Now, I think on top of these two questions, two old, old questions, quote unquote, uh, it'd be extremely important for this panel to address two sets of newer uh, questions. One is the question of the others. Uh, so it's all very well and good to talk about what the Eastern partners should be doing, what the EU should be doing, but the world does not stay put. Uh, and we have a number of other actors, uh, obviously uh, primarily here thinking about uh, Russia, but also China, uh, Turkey, uh, particularly think about the Western uh, Balkans, uh, the Gulf countries. Uh, all these actors are moving, uh, and they're moving in a context in which perhaps there is not as much movement on the side uh, of the European Union. And how is all this uh, playing out? And then the fourth, and in many respects, perhaps most important question uh, is, and it'd be interesting to hear not only, Roderick, from you as an internal EU voice, but I think it'd be particularly fascinating to hear what the views are of those that are not uh, in the European Union. Uh, how do we respond to one question uh, that uh, President uh, Macron has put to the table, uh, which I think is a valid one and a relevant one, i.e. what happens not in the process of enlargement. Mm, uh, yes, there are ways in which the enlargement process and policy can be reviewed in order to make it more effective, but what happens after members actually enter uh, the European Union to ensure that the transformation uh, is not a negative transformation, as of course we have been uh, seeing in uh, several member states of the EU as such. Now, uh, the panelists have already been introduced, so let me perhaps immediately uh, jump into a first set of uh, questions, uh, which, which really regard the, um, the, the transformation uh, side. Now, the Eastern Partnership has been um, sort of divided up mm, traditionally between front runners and not front runners. And we have two uh, front runners uh, being represented uh, here. Um, and I guess my question to, to both of you, but, but I'll sort of uh, specify to, to, to each one, is do you think this is still a valid categorization? Uh, do you feel, therefore, that the transformation uh, that has been going on in uh, Georgia and in Ukraine continues to justify uh, this categorization. Uh, and perhaps, David, if I may begin with you, uh, if I could ask you in answering this question, if you could also say a few words about how your country um, has been responding uh, to uh, bottom-up demands that have been coming from the people through demonstrations. I'm here particularly thinking about the demonstrations over the course of, uh, uh, of uh, last summer, uh, and specifically in reference to the demands for a change in the uh, electoral law, and how you see that uh, playing out in, in Georgia. David. Well, thank you, Natalie. Thank you for having me to this very interesting discussion in the Korber Foundation. And uh, uh, for your introductory remarks, very thought-provoking, and the uh, questions you put for us to answer. Um, uh, let me start by saying that uh, this year we are commemorating 10th anniversary since the establishment of Eastern Partnership. 
the, by the um, initiators of Sweden and Poland and the, one of the co-founders uh, of uh, this very visionary um, uh, the, uh, the, the policy initiative, uh, which uh, we consider as a very effective mechanism for bringing Georgia and the Eastern Partners closer to the European Union. We, of course, understand that Eastern Partnership is not a membership framework. Rather, it's a framework of uh, bringing gradually uh, approaching economically and politically to the European family of nations. So if you compare what was Georgia, for example, 10 years ago to the current uh, situation, yes, we can consider ourselves as the front runners because 10 years ago, Georgia was a country who was uh, beyond the neighborhood uh, initiative. Now we are a country which has signed association agreement together with deep and comprehensive free trade agreement, country which has visa liberalization, and, but we have more ambition, ambitious goals to move forward. Uh, and uh, uh, the formats we are cooperating with the European Union, like the security dialogue, as well as special format, which was established particularly for Georgia College to Government meeting, um, uh, the, the meeting, which is an excellent opportunity for discussing with the European Union the, uh, future-oriented goals and projects with regard how to make more effectively sectoral cooperation with the European Union, how to ensure physical integration through uh, different energy, transport, trade. Um, it's also in line with the, our domestic agenda. So um, we have our also unilateral work to do. So we are not waking, uh, waiting until the association agreement, association agenda is implemented. In parallel, we are wo working on our unilateral task. So we have initiated the Roadmap to Europe, which is a comprehensive concept paper, which envisages um, more uh, active participation into EU programs and agencies, more, which considers more physical integration with the European Union, and also to conduct all the uh, vigorous for, uh, reforms in order to prepare country functionally to, to the time for the momentum when the political decision is uh, in the European Union to be ready for this political momentum. So we are preparing ourselves for this momentum to be ready for, to meet all the criteria for uh, to become uh, the member of the European Union. You have asked about the um, transformative power. I believe that uh, the, one of the main features of the transformative power is that it's a type of soft power uh, which um, exerts attractiveness and importantly is not a coercive nature. Uh, so therefore the power to bring transformation into countries of its neighborhood largely depends first of all on foreign policy choice of the neighboring countries concerned. As far as the uh, EU uh, neighboring country maintains European integration as uh, its foreign and domestic policy goal, um, the EU's ability to play a uh, uh, transformative role in that particular country remains strong. Uh, and on the other hand, for the countries who are not interested to pursue European integration, EU's transformative power is uh, weak. So I believe that the, in our case, uh, the Georgia's case, where we are uh, demonstrating adherence to the European principles and uh, um, uh, European aspiration. At the same time, we believe that uh, EU needs to define its strategic goal. Uh, the EU should step up policies and instruments to accomplish the uh, task of the um, uh, democratic transformation uh, and uh, consolidation. EU um, uh, integration has always been one of the major motivation in Georgia. So uh, to undertake reforms, democratic nature, and you have mentioned all these reforms we have, which we conducted in the judicial reform. Now we are in the process of implementing the fourth wave of judicial reform, although the legacy which we have inherited with the pre from the previous government was not easy. You remember the, um, the, the cases which uh, the citizens of Georgia applied to the European Court of Human Rights. Now it decreased significantly 10, 11 times. So it means that this process is working well, but uh, we are not perfect. We 
we have to address all these shortcomings and challenges we are facing on a daily basis. And you have mentioned the electoral reform, which is now the issue of very sharp discussion within Georgian society. You know, that the opposition is asking for immediate uh, transform um, the movement to, to the proportional system. The, the ruling government uh, party, which also agreed to move the country to the uh, proportional system, and it, which is already reflected in the constitution, but it, it will happen in 2024. But what uh, now opposition is asking to move it from 2024 to 2020. Mm. But uh, this is the issue of discussion within the uh, parliament, and I believe that it has to be moved from the street to the parliament building, and there is room for dialogue and continuation of this dialogue within the parliament. So uh, this uh, process of uh, democratic, uh, democratic reforms is a uh, process which is still going on, and we believe that this is integral part of Georgia's European integration process. So we realize this and we are uh, moving towards uh, the eventual goal, which is a full integration into European Union. Thank you, David. Uh, Lena, let me uh, turn to, to you perhaps. Um, now, in, on the 9th of December, if I'm not uh, mistaken, um, for the first time in what? three years, uh, the Normandy format is going to meet again and uh, hopefully uh, relaunch uh, a, a process and an initiative. Now, of course, there is uh, a lot, um, most, that needs to be done um, on the side of, of Russia, but of course, there's also uh, Kiev as part of, uh, of this equation. Um, and I'm wondering if you could uh, reflect a little bit about what uh, Kiev can do to do, um, if you like, to, to give the best possible chance, or at the very least not to provide any excuse uh, for uh, this, th this process to actually uh, move forward, and in particular what Kiev can do when it comes to, again, this issue of transformation and therefore uh, reforms, uh, and in particular, uh, what are the prospects uh, for judicial reform uh, and anti-corruption reform in your country? From, with your permission, I will start with uh, some theses which I heard, I think, a week ago in Kiev from my Moldovan colleague, he said that for the Eastern Partnership countries, association agreement as an anchor for reforms. Uh, I did not express my disagreement with this thesis, but I really think that for Ukraine, <clears throat> it's not an anchor. This is a civilized choice. We made this choice six years ago. And it's really important for the citizens of Ukraine, not only because of inspirations, but that's about values, and that's about the transformation of the society. And the society became very active, and we are not just watching TV and consume information from the sources which disseminate different information. However, this also can have an implications of any kind of policy and any kind of developments, including Normandy format. Because now this activity of the society creates the new atmosphere. The atmosphere where the government and the president should deliver, deliver in accordance with expectations, and not with a hidden agenda and undercover. And that's create additional tensions, of course, in the society because we have a very polarized views concerning the future of Normandy format. Definitely, we are a victim of the hybrid aggression, and this aggression includes an informational component as well. So we hear very different kind of opinions and different expectations from the meeting of the 9th on December. 
And that's why I think that primarily important to communicate rightly with the society, to address their worries and concerns, to explain them what do we expect from this meeting and how it may actually uh, affect their lives, whether or not we are going to go forward and discuss different kind of possibilities in this format. Or we will stick only to those which are already in the Minsk processes. How we are going to implement them and what are our red lines. So that's actually things and topics which are under discussion in Ukrainian society now. And of course, the European aspirations and implementation of association agreement has also a paramount importance for the U Ukrainian citizens. We enjoy now visa-free regime. And that gave our youth populations possibility to travel more. And of course, I also talked about this in Kyiv. I think that we need to communicate more with the citizens of the European Union, because for the European Union citizens, we are strangers. And it's very typical that you are suspicious to the strangers. So that's why we should be more understandable. And we need to actually have more transparency and be more active in our communications on the different layers, not only on the diplomatic side, but also in the possibilities to have more contacts between regions, between yours, and different kind of cultural exchanges. And a few words about judicial reform. You're absolutely right that that's one of the key reforms. Because without rule of law, we will not be able to create the new society and transform this society. Because we still have some kind of implications of the Soviet legacy. But on, on specifically on judicial reform, do you feel that uh, the EU could, should be doing more, uh, or is this essentially a process that, I mean, you have everything you need to get on with it. Oh, we had, and we still have, a number of EU projects, which are specially devoted for the training of judges, for the transformation of judicial system. But anyway, we have not the fourth, I think the fifth wave of the judicial reform. And my personal opinion that the problem is much deeper that's a problem of the transformation of the mentality. Yes. Uh, I come from a country that has similar problems. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Valerie, let me uh, turn to, to you now. Now, uh, Belarus is, in many respects, in a, in, in a very different uh, predicament, but one that is no less delicate. In many respects, it's perhaps even more delicate. Um, indeed, yours is a country that has uh, a very strong interest in seeing uh, good or at least slightly better um, relations between the European Union and uh, Russia. Uh, it is a country that has not fared very well when relations uh, have been bad uh, between uh, Western European countries and, uh, and Russia. Um, so obviously you have uh, very high stakes here. Uh, now, I guess that is sort of fairly uh, clear. Um, what I'd be fascinated to hear sort of your, your reflections on is, is whether in this, um, what you consider to be your actiness, uh, if you like. I mean, are you uh, simply uh, subjects of this great game that is unfolding, or can you, despite your size, uh, but precisely because of this extremely delicate position that you yeah. hold in between, uh, actually do something uh, to ensure that uh, relations between the EU and uh, Russia begin to develop on a different uh, path. And in particular, if you could perhaps fit into 
uh, your reply, uh, how you see possible relations developing between the European Union and the Eurasian Economic Union, of which you're part. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for a very interesting question. And uh, from the very beginning, I would like to represent my view, how do we see the situation in Europe in the context of uh, Eastern policy of European Union, and uh, I mean, uh, first of all, Eastern partnership policy. Uh, for us, uh, it's obvious that the Eastern Partnership Initiative uh, was um, conceived by the European Union in order to increase uh, welfare, uh, stability, security on the eastern borders uh, of the European Union, to strengthen uh, its own positions in the region and uh, ultimately to increase the European Union's competitiveness and influence in the world. Today, uh, proceeding from the real situation that we observed here analyzing the state of affairs in the European Union itself and uh, its relations with uh, Russia, Considering uh, the developments uh, in our region, including the Eastern Partnership countries, we can state that Eastern policy of the European Union has not achieved its goals. Moreover, the security and stability in our region on the eastern borders of the European Union have been undermined and uh, its fraud with a number of threats uh, for the European Union itself. Unfortunately, in our opinion, the European Union also has a serious share of responsibility for that. Uh, why? Because from the very beginning of the Eastern policy, the European Union did not take into account the geopolitical context of the development of our region. Uh, the desire of the European Union to shape it based uh, on its own interests and values uh, without taking into account uh, to the proper extent uh, neither the interest of the Eastern Partnership countries nor Russia, which, like the European Union, also has own strategic interest in the region, has exacerbated the problems in Ukraine and around it, and in the Eastern European region as a whole. Uh, the tensions that arise uh, here work to break the region. Uh, and as a result, a crisis of relations between the European Union and Russia arose, causing damage to the European Union and the competitiveness and security of Europe as a whole. I believe that it's not possible to achieve the, access, the success of uh, the uh, Eastern Partnership without taking into account the interest of other countries and centers of powers. And uh, I mean here not only Russia, but the USA, for example, China, Turkey, you mentioned these countries, and others, who are also interested in being present in our region and are linking own well-being and security with uh, this region. In these conditions, the role of my country in European politics is objectively increasing. Why? Because we have no conflicts with any of the neighbors and key centers of powers. Moreover, we build relations with them on a pragmatic basis as an independent and sovereign state. We have kept peace and stability. We are developing dynamically. 
And as a reality is that today Europe needs Belarus as a donor of stability and security in the region. Uh, it's our country maintaining mutually respectful relations with its neighbors can help to remove the tensions that have arisen and strengthen uh, cohesion, connectivity, and compatibility in the eastern part of Europe, between the West and the East of Europe, between the European Union and Russia. And uh, this is especially important as the geopolitical tension between Russia and the West negatively affects both the stability and security in our region and the speed of democratic transformations and reforms in the Eastern Partnership countries. After all, our countries are objectively, objectively interested in building cooperation not only with the European Union, but also with Russia. And the solution, as we see, in the pragmatization of the European Union's foreign policy and the improvement of relations between the European Union and Russia, uh, and uh, taking into account, the, uh, as I said, uh, the interest of other centers of power and countries in our region. Uh, today, uh, with the example of Belarus, uh, the country, as I uh, said, uh, which has uh, good uh, neighborhood, uh, good uh, uh, relations with uh, uh, our neighbors. It's possible to form a completely different model of the relationship between the geopolitical centers of power in our region. It can become a region of cooperation between the European Union and the uh, Russian Federation, rather than territory for which Disputes are being waged. Who will have greater influence here? We do not need conflicts. Member States of the European Union, to our mind, should choose dialogue with Russia instead of exerting pressure on it through a sanction policy in the interest of ensuring stability and security in our region and Europe as a whole. And it's very important to diminish the impact by such a policy, as I uh, mentioned, uh, to diminish the impact of pressure exerted by the Russian Federation to the Eastern Partnership countries. And I'm not speaking here as advocate of Russia, of course, but proceeding, proceeding from our national interest to develop uh, as prosperous, democratic, independent and sovereign state. And to our mind, spirit, and we convinced in that, spirit and nature of the Eastern Partnership policy should be non-confrontational. Conflicts can be only resolved through dialogue, diplomacy, and honest engagement. And we reiterate our firm support to peaceful resolution of conflicts. Partnership and close cooperation could only help to consolidate the wider Europe without dividing lines, increase its competitiveness, security, and economic well-being of its peoples. And uh, what I would like to stress, for Belarus, the only acceptable op uh, option for the development of a common European situation is mutual understanding and rapprochement between Russia and the European Union, and the only right policy and strategy are good, balanced, and constructive relations with both Russia and the European Union. Thank you, uh, Valery. And I think, uh, indeed, I mean, you know, to, to me, the question, the, the goal is, is, is fairly clear. I think we would all want to have a good and constructive relationship between the EU and Russia. Uh, the big question mark is, is how to achieve it. I was interested uh, the, the, that you, you put a, sort of a lot of emphasis when talking about interests um, in saying that the European Union should be taking into account the interests of others uh, more. And 
And in a sense, I'm just wondering whether um, that, that kind of makes sense. I mean, one thing is to say that in developing a strategy, you need to have a sort of clear understanding and analysis of what the interests of others are. But then you pursue your own interest. To me, if I were to make a criticism about EU policy in the past, um, it is that perhaps it was not clear enough uh, in articulating what its interests uh, were. Not so much the fact that it was not taking into account the interests of others, which indeed it may have not have done, but that's what others are for. Everyone kind of, kind of presumably looks after their interests. Uh, and so in, in approaching the Eastern partnership countries, and, and, and perhaps before I turn to you, Roderick, I know that Olena wanted to uh, jump in on this. Um, it's, um, it, the EU made an offer, uh, and it, it was an offer that could have been refused. Uh, it was not coercively imposed upon, upon anyone, and in the same way as the EU uh, has been pursuing its interests, perhaps not being very clear on what those are, uh, but has been doing so in ways that are more or less effective, um, Ukraine, Georgia, uh, could have said no. <laughs> <laughs> if I may, I would agree with one of the points which made uh, just recently, because I definitely think that Eastern Partnership did not address one particular challenge. That's a security challenge. And we all knew that the elephant was in the room. Mm. And we can name this elephant. That's Russian Federation. Mm. Mm. And I don't think that we might call aggression as a problem, because aggression is an aggression. And we have different type of this aggression, and we experience this aggression not because of the Eastern Partnership, but because Russia violated international law. And let's be clear with this, and not pretend that this situation does not exist. And invasion in Crimea, was not a reaction on the European Eastern Partnership policy. And not because Ukrainian people has chosen to be the part of the European Union. Sorry. Yes, indeed. Um, Roderick, let me turn to you now um, as um, uh, the, the only uh, representative of an EU member state uh, on, uh, on this panel, um, I inevitably have to be quite harsh on you. Um, and, uh, and, and so I have a, a couple of questions, but they all really revolve around this issue of what is it that uh, we want when it comes to uh, the Eastern Partnership countries, and what are we willing to give uh, in order to make it uh, happen? Um, one answer is, well, um, we have uh, association agreements and we have uh, the deep and comprehensive uh, free trade agreements and there's a lot of implementation that still needs to be done. Uh, and that is what we want and what we uh, have offered and, and are simply implementing it. So that's, I think, one possible answer. Uh, another answer, uh, and obviously they're not mutually uh, exclusive, is well, obviously, you know, there's only so much that we can uh, continue, uh, only for so much that we can t continue with this with this narrative. And yes, it's true that a lot still needs to be done. But what is the ultimate form of this relationship? What is it that we're after? Uh, which is a question which we have never really addressed as, as uh, Europeans and that has created a lot of the misunderstandings on all sides uh, um, that in, in different ways both uh, Olena, David and uh, Valerie were, uh, were referring to. Um, is there something alongside uh, the Eastern Partnership that addresses the security uh, aspect of this, uh, of this equation? Um, so yes, I mean, I guess the sort of big question here is what, what, what is it that we're after and above all, how is it that we can hope to increase our 
leverage uh, and influence on countries in the Eastern Partnership. Also, if I may, making the connection with what uh, we're doing, or rather what we're not doing, um, in, in the Western Balkans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Natalie, and also for the great questions. Hopefully the answers might come not so close to it. Um, nevertheless, um, let's not forget where we are coming from. Next year we will celebrate the 45th uh, anniversary of the Helsinki Accords. And the roots of these accords have, at the end, teared down the wall. They have encouraged the population on both sides of the Iron Curtain. And the main idea was then to implement organizations and institutions who are based on values and were also based on uh, issues to avoid security conflicts and to establish peace. And today, nearly 40, uh, 45 years later, we see that our partners have formulated interests, but we in the inside the European Union have a pattern of different interests, and we are in some areas really more behind than 30 years ago. That means as you mentioned, the Western Balkans, and I was very, I'm very grateful to listen to the assessments of, of our Eastern friends here at the table. And I think the decision, especially of our big, great neighbor in the West, to stop the accession process has damaged also the relationship inside the Eastern Partnership. Because the European Union has lost leverage and credibility, and has raised expectations from third parties, from spoilers. They see they have influence. And I do not only want to mention organized crime or terrorism or corruption. I would also like to mention the strategic interest of Russia to destroy the cohesion of the European Union. And they are quite effective by a low investment of means. And we have a strong interest of Turkey and Saudi Arabia in the Western Balkans. We have a very strong interest of China, not cooperating with the European Union, but choosing the way 17 plus one. Because as they told us in a recent visit, the European Union is much too bureaucratic. This leads me also to some housework we have. First of all, France might be right in the one direction that we need to reshuffle the Brussels structures. But those who also propose that NATO might be brain dead have no solution to improve NATO, and they have also no solution to improve the European Union. So I would like to ask our friend who has mentioned that he should come up with constructive proposals. And therefore, if we are willing to change something, and if we have an aim for the Eastern Partnership, the aim must be clearly defined accession to the European Union, nothing else. And this based on the Charter of Paris, which means free choice for partnerships, free choice for alliances, also for Russia, and not to violate borders. This is the smallest common denom denominator but it's the most important one, because this creates reliability. And look at Ukraine. Ukraine was the third strongest nuclear power after the fall of the wall. And they handed over all their nuclear weapons to Russia with the, with the Budapest uh, Agreement. You will not convince any country having nuclear weapons to hand over nuclear weapons in the future, having in mind the violation of the Budapest Agreement and the Carta of Paris by Russia in 2014. Therefore, I think the core interest of the European Union must be to regain credibility and therefore to offer a real choice. And the choice must be in three directions. The first choice is to be open for access, condition-based and also with clear-cut criteria. There is no free meal. It must be based on criteria and also very conditioned. But this must be 
the first and most important offer. We are open for accession. The second is we are willing to cooperate also with the Euro-Asian partnership and economic organization created by Russia and partners of them. And the third is European Union and NATO must also be open for disruptive and innovative proposals, which means how to create a common house of European security and stability. One of the organizations which were found after the Helsinki process was the OSCE. We need to revitalize the OSCE. Albania will take over presidency. Uh, hopefully Norway will, 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 will join uh, once in a while for a presidency. We need a lot of common endeavor. And how to increase leverage? I think we will have to bridge and mitigate a lot, unfortunately. But it's not only structure, it's not only European Commission, it's not only the, the very dovetailed approach of the European Union. The European Union, regarding her relationship to Ukraine, was too much checklist-oriented and not value-oriented. We should have had much more pressure on, on certain institutions inside Ukraine. We also should offer Georgia more support, also moral support. And we should ask the political representatives in all these countries, including Belarus, to better communicate with their population, with the voters, to offer transparency, to offer participation, to give them the chance to create together a way towards more peace and stability. And the clear offer is of the European Union and some proposals to, to, to mitigate. We need to strengthen our connectivity. That means infrastructure, not only via the internet, but also via railways to ease visa liberalization, like we did with Georgia, which increased tremendously the, the numbers of tourists. So we need to enhance the exchange of young scientists, of the younger generation, of families, of small and medium enterprises. We should also counter Russia with openness in this context. If Russian families can much more easily travel to the European Union, they will come back with a narrative of the European Union. We should be disruptive and innovative in this context. Uh, and another proposal, we should improve regional cooperation. What should we tell to Vucic when he listens to Macron what should we tell to Vucic when, when he is trying to establish the four basic freedoms of the European Union to Albania and to Northern Macedonia, which is an excellent proposal, but for him it's, it isn't worthwhile because the European Union has withdrawn due to the, to the bad decision so far. So, and the last remark in this context, it's also a responsibility for Germany and those partners like-minded to convince those who are reluctant for openness and access. If we are not outspoken enough, we would feed authoritarian states also inside the European Union. We would feed authoritarian movements and we should better explain to our populations, including Germany, what is the advantage of a better cooperation and of being access, accessible on the basis I mentioned on the core roots of the Helsinki Accord. Thank you. Thank you, Roderick. Um, I, I completely agree with you and I think though that uh, innovation and disruption is something that we should uh, sort of think about when indeed thinking about what is it that we uh, do uh, with respect to countries in the Western Balkans and countries in the Eastern uh, Partnership. Uh, but there's also quite a lot of innovation that we need to do inside. Uh, you rightly mentioned the imperative of persuading the skeptics, and obviously here uh, the French uh, president is uh, king amongst them. Um, but, but to do so, uh, one needs to address what are the, I mean, there are lots of invalid concerns, but what are the valid concerns that are put on the table? And it seems to me that that is really a question about not reforming the enlargement policy or not 
necessarily reforming the Eastern Partnership Policy, but reforming the EU itself. How do we ensure that the Serbia of tomorrow entering the European Union is not going to end up like Hungary? Hungary, to mention uh, the obvious case, was the first of the class. Uh, in the enlargement process of the 1990s. What happened after? I think unless we provide, I don't know what the answer to the question is, but unless we provide uh, a good answer to that question, I'm afraid President Macron has a point uh, that is uh, and should be of concern to all of us. Well, if I, if I may, very briefly, I think we need also to be patient. I think the Hungarian civil population, civil society, is well aware about some changes inside society. They have not enough skilled workers, so they need probably uh, legal migration into work. They need also a migration law and something like that. Change will come, I'm very confident. But to mention the security aspect, I believe that we can offer something. A third party agreement, we will have to work on it with uh, the United Kingdom after Brexit. We need a third party agreement with Turkey and with the Western Balkan states, and I do not exclude also Ukraine. This has to be done not cooperatively with Russia, but it has to be communicated to Russia. It is an offer that we try to establish a culture of security according to our European political and strategic uh, strategy as of 2016. It's very worth to be read. And based on that, we have all the tools. We should develop a common security culture, which includes the Charter of Paris and certain offers. And on the other side, we also need the facilities and the ability of these partner states regarding uh, civil cohesion, regarding civil service, regarding as well uh, some resilient programs they have in their countries. So at the long term, we should start to establish a courts of security, which is an offer from our side, which needs to be negotiated, but based on the Charter of Paris, uh, is not exclusive to anybody who, meet, who meets the criteria as well as the uh, standards. Elena, you wanted it, and David as well. If I may, I think that, for instance, for Ukraine, it's very important to know that there is a light in the end of the tunnel. Yes, and it exists. <laughs> and all kind of signals which we receive concerning the accession of the Balkan countries has an implication on our internal policies as well. And you're absolutely right that any kind of accession process should be value orientated, not just the checklist that we implemented all kind of EU laws in our legal system, because it creates another atmosphere. We can be very good in implementation of the laws, but then we have to work with these laws, and this depends. The mentality point yes. that you were making earlier. Yes. Yeah. And I think that uh, the countries like Poland and Hungary, they're a very good example of developments and this difference between the technical accession and mental accession. Yeah. David. Yes, uh, first of all, I would like to share the position expressed by our German colleague with regard of uh, uh, new innovative approaches from Europe towards countries of Eastern Partnership who already demonstrated significant progress toward uh, uh, integration and uh, uh, we believe that the EU should be more decisive uh, when countries like Georgia and Ukraine are demonstrating the serious progress they have to be reciprocated otherwise it causes serious frustration internally and also it's a wrong signal internally and also externally to our northern neighbor. You know, when a country like Georgia fails to deliver on the, um, the, the NATO or EU integration process, it uh, causes wrong signal because according to um, recent polls conducted in Georgia, the, the, the huge majority of population supports uh, NATO integration, 71%. Uh, the EU is even more, more than 80% support the EU integration. So it's a big advantage for the government when you have such huge number of population backing you. It encourages you to make bold steps towards membership. But unfortunately, 
uh, every time, you know, we are gathering in the, during, in the NATO summits or the, the ministerial meetings, the EU Eastern Partnership Ministerial or uh, the, the other uh, big gatherings, you know, we are hearing a lot of positive evaluation or progress made by Georgia, but unfortunately it's not translated into political decision. We understand, we understand the current situation. We are not naive to think that the situation which Europe itself is facing internally, all this uh, endless discussion on Brexit, on the, uh, the migration challenges, uh, as well as budgetary issues which are discussed within the European Union. These are not, and also European, Europe's skepticism expressed by uh, different uh, EU member states. It's not sending positive signals. It's not creating solid ground for enlargement project, process. But I believe that it should not discourage us for continuing our efforts and uh, to be in line with our reform agenda, to be in line with the, all the criteria which is required for um, uh, the um, aspirant countries like Georgia. And in addition to security environment, you know, I also uh, would like to emphasize this very important aspect. You know, Georgia uh, continues to be the subject of uh, um, uh, crippled annexation and uh, continued occupation. It started in 2008. What happened in Georgia, it was repetition of Ukraine of 2014. So that's why I believe that uh, EU should be more vocal and explicit by uh, evaluating the current situation. We simply have to call a spade a spade. Mm -hmm. Uh, when uh, we, on a daily, as we speak right now, this process of illegal borderization in Georgia is going on. Just a couple of weeks ago, the famous Georgian doctor, he was kidnapped and detained in the occupied territory because for simple reason, he went to treat his patient in the occupied region. Now he's in custody, sentenced for two months imprisonment. So we are asking international community to increase pressure on the forces on the Russian Federation who is entertaining effective control on these territories. But unfortunately, uh, these people, uh, the ethnic Georgians who have sporadically returned back to their permanent places of residence, they are suffering. Families are divided. They have no access to their agricultural land to work. They are denied to get education in their native language. We should not turn blind eye on all of these illegal activities. And it will, because it will send wrong signal to Georgian society, to our um, uh, people, which are united under the one goal. And it was mentioned by uh, our Ukrainian colleague that uh, we need uh, constantly to have ultimate goal, mm. which helps us to consolidate uh, internally. Uh, I, I want to remind you when back in uh, 2010, we have started the process of association negotiations with the European Union, it helped us to consolidate the whole interna uh, internal community, the whole political parties, opposition, uh, ruling government party, we were united under this goal. Mm. Yeah, this goal was accomplished, achieved. There was another one, the visa liberalization, which was not only a technical uh, decision, it was an yeah. important political message to uh, Georgian people. This mission is accomplished again. Now we need another ultimate goal, and this ultimate goal is uh, European perspective. It will definitely help us to consolidate uh, Georgian society toward this goal, and also to keep us in good shape for continuing uh, economic, political, and democratic reforms. If I may, just one word. I want to really open it up to the floor. Yes, uh, that's not about accession itself. That's about even opening of negotiation concerning accession. Because even this can be a positive signal for the society. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and thank you also uh, for putting, uh, D David, the emphasis on, on, on public opinion mm -hmm. uh, and this uh, incredible leverage, to go back to a word that was used, that actually we do have. I mean, you know, we wish we had these kind of percentages of support mm -hmm. for the European Union inside uh, the European Union. But let me open it up to the floor, Volker. And please introduce yourself. Volker Peltis. Uh Director of the German Institute for International Security Affairs, Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik. I guess my question goes to David uh, Zarkaliani, and it follows up from the last discussion. You said, David, that, and I try to, to quote you, that the EU still has a formidable transformative uh, power for those countries who actually are willing to, at the end of the day, enter the European Union. Uh, that's a good equation, but I think there is another part of the equation, and we mentioned it, which is the door has to be open uh, eventually. 
And the question is, uh, if it is not open, I think even uh, negotiations about access, I mean, opening the talks about uh, access, uh, uh, accession doesn't really help, as we saw in the case of Turkey, and hope may translate or backslide into frustration or even, which is worse, resentment. So the question is, if it simply could happen that it doesn't happen, if it could be that it doesn't happen, because we do have countries in the European Union who need a popular vote, who need a referendum on future accessions. Um, we have a fear in countries in the European Union, not only that newcomers would change into something like Hungary, but that probably some of our original six in the EU could change into something like Hungary if there are absolute majorities for someone like Salvini or Le Pen or others. So, so if there is the risk that it simply wouldn't happen, wouldn't it be up onto the reformers like Georgia and others to think about what kind of alternative you could have mm -hmm. or you could devise for a close association to the European Union? Uh, I remember, I think it was former Commission President Prodi who once said everything but a vote. Mm -hmm. um, which is basically what the Norwegians have. Mm -hmm. And we had the Norwegian foreign minister here. So some countries did make a choice that they don't want to enter, that they don't want to vote, but they, don't, they want to be as closely associated and as closely in the internal market and others uh, as EU members. So the question is to you, is there any fantasy on, on your mm -hmm. side and the side uh, of similar countries, reformers, who would almost be in if there wasn't resistance, to think about an alternative form of association. Um, I have a question over here. Um, here, the gentleman. Yeah. Dr. Semenya, National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine. I have actually two but short questions. To Mr. Varanevsky, when you explained uh, your model, Belarus model, of some kind of balancing, trying to compromise, I, I suppose everybody in this room would, would agree with you, would share this view that it will be much more likely to happen in some kind of best world, but we have a real world. What makes you believe that current great elephant in the room named Russia would agree with your vision, would go on such kind of compromise? Because actually our Ukrainian experience and from other sides actually evidence that it was not the case. Maybe you do know some, some crystal ball recipe which makes you believe that this could happen. And question to Ms. Akizaveta, you were absolutely right. We need some kind of flagship at the end of the tunnel, namely some kind of perspective of accession. But it could be already, I don't believe in this for the next years to come, but if let's imagine if it happened and the European Union will address, be it Georgia, be it Ukraine, that you have this kind of perspective. Are you ready? Because we did know from experience, do know now that sometimes in this issue, the interest, the so-called interests of Russia don't correspond with your interests. Are you ready to pay the price if you make this signal and Russia, in turn, makes another steps? Are you ready? Uh, lady to your right. Sorry. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sofia Moreira, uh, Ambassador of the European Union in Cabo Verde. Um, I heard in, in this panel, and it was a fantastic discussion, but uh, at least twice the word communication. Mm -hmm. Deputy Foreign Minister of Ukraine mentioned the need to communicate what is Ukraine to the European population. And uh, Mr. Kiesvetter mentioned the need to communicate to member states who are more sceptical about enlargement and to the EU population the advantages of this enlargement. Now, it's, um, we, we all agree on this as well, on the need to communicate, but how and who can, can, can do it? How do you see the role of the EU representations in the uh, in neighborhood countries in this regard? Of course, we need first to have a clear message to communicate. But second, how can we do this outreach? And regarding the skeptical member states on enlargement and the population, how to communicate in an era where people only read one sentence and get attached to, to the negative news? Who can do this and what would be the role of the national parliaments? Thank you. Uh, Sergei? Uh, 
the top, uh, Primakov Institute of World Economy and International Relations, Russian Academy of Sciences, Moscow. I have a question to Alan Zerkal. Uh, in one of your recent interviews, you said that uh, your intention to quit diplomatic service is related to the willingness of the Ukrainian government to become friends with Russia, if I understood that correctly. Um, I first uh, wonder if indeed this could be an intention of uh, any uh, uh, foreseeable Ukrainian government to be friends with Russia under the existing circumstances, it rather looks like uh, it is not. And then if uh, you are critical towards the policy line which is implemented uh, uh, towards Russia by the uh, incumbent Ukrainian government, you uh, might have uh, an alternative suggestion. So what would your alternative suggestion be if you would be the principal advisor on foreign policy to uh, this president uh, on the relationship with Russia and on the Normandy and Minsk? Uh, Tom, not all behind you. Hi, Tom Nuttall from The Economist. Um, a question to Mr. Gizavetta. You said that um, the French president shouldn't simply block the accession process without producing specific proposals to reform it. We now do have a non-paper that's been circulated by the French with some ideas on how to reform the, pro uh, reform the process. So could you give us your assessment of some of the ideas that are in this? And in particular, do you think that this is a, a good faith effort to reform the accession process or simply a way to kill it? Mm. And maybe a quick question to some of the other panelists. I wonder if we're thinking about accession more broadly, is it a problem that one of the big countries that has traditionally been a champion of enlarging the EU, the United Kingdom, is no longer in the room mm. when it comes mm. to these mm. discussions? Mm. Mm. Uh, had, yeah, questions over there at the back. Thank you very much. Elena Chernenko from Commerçant newspaper in Moscow. I have a question to the, foreign minister, uh, to the representatives of the foreign ministries of Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, recently, uh, the former uh, Ger uh, General, um, Secretary General of NATO, Anders Rasmussen, uh, suggested that Belize should consider um, accessing NATO without Abkhazia and sorts of Thetia. So, uh, for Mr. Zalkariani, the question is, would Belize consider this? And the same question goes to Alena Zerkal. Uh, would Ukraine consider entering NATO without Crimea and maybe Donbass? Thank you. Okay, so let me uh, go back to uh, the panel, perhaps beginning with you, Roderick. Okay, fine. First of all, to the question uh, of the Ukrainian security advisor regarding Russian interests and whether we are ready to pay the price. Well, I do not think that Russia will keep as it is. And it's also up to us in the European Union um, to help to shape. Uh, here in the room is my colleague Andreas Nick, who is heading the German delegation to the European Council. He was one of those who brought Russia back into the European Council, against also some protests. But we need to give the Russian population a, vote, uh, a voice. And the voice is inside the European Council as well needed, also regarding legacy and something else. Second remark on Russia. What is the future of Russia? Demography, climate change, energy security, relationship with China. There, are, there is a struggle ongoing. Some who say we could not cooperate further with China because we dwarf ourselves, and others say we need to cooperate also as a sign towards the West so that the future is a strong Russian-Chinese alliance. I see Russia on that way, but in the future they will see that it might have been the wrong one. So we need to keep the doors open, and we need a parallel, or as a former soldier, I say a kind of envelope approach. What does this mean? We need on the one side clear-cut conditions for cooperation with the European Union and to become a member, but on the other side a program which enhances and enables the neighbors to meet this. and to offer Russia cooperation. And therefore, we need to, they need to meet, as well as Ukraine, the Minsk uh, standards, the Minsk agreement issues. And we have also regarding uh, arms control, um, confidence building measures, other areas where they need to cooperate with us, and we need to cooperate with, with, them. So, with them. So I would like to put the need for cooperation in the middle of the discussion, and not the need of separation. And the price, yes, if we do not defend our values, if we do not 
uh, stick to the plan of openness for the European Union, the European Union will lose leverage, will lose influence, and at the end will fail completely. And I'm wearing not Fridays for Future stickers here, I'm wearing a Europe for Future sticker. I see the need that we reform ourselves as fast as it is possible. And this leads me to uh, the question of Tom regarding the reform of the accession process. I think we need something in between. As soon as certain standards are achieved, we need a kind of third party agreement which includes security. It's a provision of security if the special state, states so want. So we should not exclude security out of the process. We need to include security guarantees as well, also as a sign to others who would like to spoil as regards the, the reform process. Nevertheless, it, it would uh, be too long if I were to allude now to, to, the, to the reform agenda of the European Union. The first is how can we re-achieve credibility and the European Union should concentrate and focus on core issues like energy security, migration, uh, development uh, cooperation, as well as infrastructure programs and the rule of law. To uh, the lady who is working as a representative to the European Union, I see one possibility really that the key figures go to the people, also the members of parliament not only of the national, for example, committees of foreign affairs or committees of European affairs, but also to invite others from partner countries. We need town hall meetings. We need the, the invitations. We need also a program, not only the Erasmus program for, for uh, future leaders, we need also for skilled workers for vocational training offers to visit Brussels and also to be present in the different states. That's a huge invest, but we need to invest this because the alternatives is a complete failure. Thank you so far. Thank you. Uh, Valerie. Thank you. Uh, what uh, I would like to underline answering uh, the question concerning uh, Russia policy in our region. Uh, first of all, Russia is interested in security and stability on the own borders. It's national interest of Russia. But of course, Russia is very interested in close cooperation and good relations with the European Union. The European Union, the same, is interested in security and stability on the eastern borders. And for European Union also, it's very important to have close cooperation with Russia. It's a question of the competitiveness of uh, the European Union. Uh, and uh, as for Eastern Partnership countries. Very briefly, because I've been uh, ordered to close uh, immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, as for Eastern Partnership countries, we should take into account the interest of Russia, nas national interest of Russia, and interest of the European Union. And uh, that's why we should, uh, while pursuing own foreign policy, should take into account this. And we should not be a field for rivalry between global political players. And we believe that stability and long-term prosperity of the Eastern Partnership countries, and this uh, very important, uh, it's very important for stability and prosperity of the European Union. Okay. And for Russia. And that's why developments in the Eastern Partnership countries have a direct impact on Europe as a whole, including the European Union, Russia, and Eastern Partnership countries. And in uh, this context, the Eastern Partnership should remain high on the agenda of the European Union. And what I would like to add in yeah. this context, 
In our opinion, it's necessary to strengthen the role and involvement in the Eastern Partnership of Germany and France as the locomotives of the European Union. To our mind, it would contribute to consolidation of Europe and uh, success of Eastern Partnership policy. Thank okay. you. Olena. I have only 30 seconds. That's why I will be very brief. So I don't believe that Russia is interested in stability and security in Europe. So that's why uh, I don't think that any kind of peaceful processes uh, can go ahead without understanding of this issue. And concerning reconciliation process, I think that any kind of reconciliation process should be based on accountability. And that's my stable position, and I do think that we need to take this into account and communicate this very clearly. And about communication and future of the Eastern Partnership, I do think that we need to develop region cooperation and to communicate between regions and between people, and that's the future of the Eastern Partnership. Thank you, Elena. Uh, I will be also very brief to answer the question on the on what are the um, other forms of cooperation, integration within the European Union. We are considering all forms, and uh, uh, there is no other alternative just to continue knocking on Europe's door and also to consider, explore the ways of uh, other forms. It was mentioned the Norway, the EEA, for example, everything but institutions. This is also under consideration for us as well. We are coming from, uh, with new initiatives on um, uh, the, to so, how, somehow to revitalize, to reactivate EU plus associated trio format. Also connectivity was mentioned uh, and uh, the uh, proposing also Eastern Partnership Investment pl Platform, single Euro payment area, digital single market. These are the issues which we are discussing um, um, uh, internally and also with our, internal, uh, our European partners how to move further. There was question regarding the accession to NATO without uh, the um, uh, occupied territories, Abkhazia, South Ossetia. First of all, it was misinterpretation of the NATO Secretary General's uh, position. Uh, the NATO recognizes Georgia within its internationally recognized borders. And in, back in 2008, when it was made decision in the Bucharest summit that Georgia will become the NATO member, it was considered that Georgia within its internationally recognized borders, like later on when uh, in Georgia was um, accepted as an aspirant country, it was uh, considered Georgia within its international uh, recognized borders. So this is my answer and our po position with regard to this. Thank you very much. Thanks to all our panelists, and please uh, join me in thanking this wonderful.